lectures that we had, sort of, because it all connects with same year. We're going to talk a little bit about tradition, but also we'll talk a, little, a lot about incarnation, because the church, our church, Catholic Church, reflect, reflects a lot when we talk about St. Mary on the incarnation of Christ. So this is one of the meetings. One of the prayers um, of St. Antonio is here, and he says, Awake, O my heart, your chords and praise of the Virgin Mary, lift up your voice and sing, the one who is the church, the daughter of David, who gave birth to the life of the Lord. This is obviously a small, nice prayer that St. Antonio used to meditate on uh, the Virgin Mary and her place in the church. And the incarnation. We're going to sort of hit the ground running and we're going to talk already right away about the virginity of St. Mary. So when we talk about the virginity of St. Mary, there's a, a couple of things we have to bear in mind. That we're going to talk about her virginity before uh, she gave birth to Christ, her perpetual virginity, which was intact after she had given birth to Christ uh, physically at the moment of birth, and also um, her continuing, her continual virginity uh, with the life of uh, in, in her life to St. Joseph after she uh, has given birth to Christ. So in Isaiah 7, 14, it says, Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son. And it labels her the virgin and not just the virgin. We know that um, the story of Simeon, when he was translating this and the angel appeared to him and he was confused about the virgin, and he just wanted to write a girl or a woman, and the angel said, No, I have to leave it the way it is, and you're going to live until the day that the prophecy is fulfilled to see it actually come, come to life. So, um, we see that she's called the Virgin. Also, in Matthew chapter 1, verse 20, um, the Virgin Mary is called St. Joseph's wife. So, she's referred to as his wife. So, this is causes a lot of confusion sometimes when we talk about is she a wife or was she not his wife yet or what's going on exactly. Um, it is also important to note that the pregnancy, um, St. Mary was pregnant during the period, the period when she was engaged to St. Joseph. And that, that period is called the betrothal. And that was a little bit different in the Jewish tradition and the engagement that we know of today. There are three words that describe um, the, the status of a woman who is with a man. One was Alma, second was Hetula, and the third one was Isa. These were, these were Hebrew terms that were uh, given to women who were somehow connected to a man. The first one, the Alma, means a woman who is engaged to a man to be married to him. So they're already engaged. Um, it was a sort of a contract that they had to sign. She was in every way his wife, except that they didn't actually live together. So um, if he died, she would collect uh, all the inheritance because she was lawfully his wife. Uh, if she committed adultery, she would go through the punishment of, of a normal wife that a normal wife would go through. So Alma is in every way a married woman, except for actual uh, like intercourse, actually living with her husband. A Betula is just a virgin who's not married, um, who has nothing to do with a man. And Lisa, which is the third, is an actual married woman. So when, when Isaiah in chapter 7, verse 14 talks about, and the virgin shall conceive and give birth to a son, the word in Hebrew is Alma, the first one, who's an actual engagement, um, lawful as a, as a wedding would be, but not actually his wife living in the same house. So that is why in Matthew, uh, uh, the translation of a wife actually means um. So, why virgin birth? What's so special about St. Mary giving birth and her being a virgin before she gives birth to Christ? Christ is begotten out of time from the Father. So ever since the existence, ever since the creation, Christ has always been there from the beginning. He was begotten from the Father. But he was out of time. But then, in actual time, he was born of the Virgin Mary. So he was begotten out of the Father without a mother, out of time. But in time in our world, he was born of Saint Mary, but without a father. Why is that important? It's important because since Christ has no earthly father, he always points to his Father in heaven. We all know that there's a correlation between Christ and the Father. There is no earthly father that people can say, this was just a normal marriage, Christ is just a normal being like everybody else. Also, it goes to show that this is not a new person who was just born. When two people are married and um, the wife gives birth to a son, this is a new person coming to life. But in the case of Christ, it's not a new person, this is a person who's been uh, there ever since the beginning. 
There's a term that we use in the Catholic Church a lot, it's called, the term is epatinos. And that is uh, a term given or coined by St. Peter of Alexandria in the, in the year 311 AD. And the term means ever virgin. So it goes to speak about the perpetual virginity of St. Mary, not just her being a virgin before Christ, but her continuing being a virgin after she had given birth to Christ. And the term was also used by St. Athanasius in many of his writings. St. Ignatius of Antioch uh, comments on the mystery of the ever virginity of St. Mary. He says, there are three things in the church that are very mysterious, that nobody can really figure out how they happen, we just know that they happen. One is the incarnation of Christ, how is the, or the incarnation of God. Second is the virginal birth of St. Mary, and how she continued to be a virgin after she gave birth, and the death of, and the death of Christ, because we all know that God cannot die. So all these are mysteries in the church that we don't know exactly how they happen, but they know that they can actually happen. There is an extra canonical book called the Proto Evangelium of James, or the Gospel of St. James. This book was written in the year 145 or so, and most of what we know today and what we've always known about St. Mary comes actually from this book. So we all know that St. Mary was given to the temple when she was three years old. We know all that, that St. Mary was born to um, two old, older parents, uh, Joachim and, and Anna, and when she uh, when her mother gave birth to her, she vowed her and she consecrated her to the temple when she was three years old. None of this stuff is written in the Gospels. We know all this stuff from the Proto Evangelium of St. James. So, um, the story goes that she was three years old, she was given to the temple, she turned 12, she was vowed to consecrate her life as a virgin to the temple. She turned 12 and she can no longer live in the temple. So, the elders, or the, the priests and the rabbis of the temple, gathered all the elders and said, We have to have somebody take St. Mary in and be her guardian. So the way they used to do that was he would marry her, he would become betrothed to her, but he's in a way her, her guardian, he's not her actual husband. So they gathered all the elders and they collected all their staffs and they kept them in the temple. And the next day, as the priest was handing back the staffs to each of the elders, the one when he came to hand St. Joseph back his staff, a dove uh, came out of it and it started hovering around and then it flew. So that's how they all knew that St. Joseph is always going to be taken on charge of St. Mary. Um, back to the perpetual virginity of St. Mary now. So, also in the book of the of James, we have all heard of, of, of Salome. And Salome was one of the uh, women present at the actual uh, birth of Christ. She was there when the whole thing happened. And the text records that um, she witnessed the actual birth and she testified that the Virgin Mary, after she gave birth, she was still a virgin. She, she was there, she saw the whole thing happen, and she had to die. Origen also uh, comments on the story according to, to the tradition of the uh, custom of the Catholic Church. And the tradition goes that after St. Mary had given birth to Christ, um, and after her, day, her days had passed, one day she went into the temple. And back then in the temple, the virgins used to sit on one side and the married women would sit on a different side. So she went to sit. Uh, once she walked in the temple, all the women who were married knew she, she just gave birth to Christ. They told her, no, no, you can't sit with the virgins. You have to come sit with the married women. And Zechariah, the priest, came and said, no, she sits still with the virgins because she's still a virgin. And also that story in the uh, uh, Pope of the So. I mean, this is this the Proto Evangelium. That's a Deuter canonical book, or is it? We, is it the fathers call it an extra canonical book. Okay. Um, it's it's not part of the the, the Deuter canonical books that belong in the Bible, but it's we still can rely on a lot of information from. It. Some some of the stuff are debatable. That's why, like it says that the actual uh, the actual birth of Christ didn't take place uh, took place in a cave, for example. So uh, some things are good. And this is not the only one, actually. There's the Odds of Solomon, you guys have ever heard of it. It's also a, a canon, or an extra canonical book that goes to say that the Virgin Mary, when she gave birth to Christ, she gave birth without pain. She didn't incur any, any pain in her labor. So this is, we've heard that in the Catholic Church before. So this is where, like all these extra canonical books is where this information comes from. So um, why do we care so much about perpetual virgin Obviously, uh, she just gave birth to God. God was incarnate and she gave birth to God. 
Why is that so special? Why, well, why couldn't she just resume a normal life right after that? Well, you just have to think of how unique this event is. It happens once in the history of, of humanity and it will never happen again. She gave birth to God. So who's, who's, who is she going to give birth to after God was just going to be like a normal son? It just doesn't make any sense. If the monks vowed themselves, she had already, she was already consecrated, she had vowed herself uh, to the temple and she was for God. There's no way she was going to give up that and live just a normal life because she didn't have to. She just gave birth to a one and son. Um, we just talked about her consecration. Also, uh, St. Augustine, he comments on the verse in Luke chapter 1, verse 34, where she says, when, a, when an angel comes to announce the birth, the Virgin Mary, and she says, how can this be when I do not know a man? She was already engaged to St. Joseph by then. So he comments and says, St. Mary and St. Joseph had vowed a vow of celibacy, a vow of virginity. And that is why when the angel came to her, she said, how can this happen? I don't know a man. I'm not married. I'm never going to be married in the normal way that people are. So how can I give birth? So he also, so he comments on that and says that they had already, prior to their engagement or betrothal, they had vowed that they would save her. Also in the, in the icons of the, in the Orthodox icons, we see, um, like we were talking about it last week, the icons are not really just drawn and written, so it tells a story. In the top one, I, I know you can't really see much, but that's the story of the Nativity. And uh, on the right, there's Salumi sitting with, um, with the baby, and the baby had apples and they had given birth to him. And we just talked about how she witnessed the perpetual virginity of St. Mary. Also, it's customary, a lot of icons of St. Mary that you see, and it's also hard to see on this, and I apologize, that there are three stars in the icon on the bottom. You see there's a star on her left shoulder, there's a star on her forehead, and a star on her right shoulder. And this goes to show that she was a virgin, and the fathers referred to it as um, antipartum, antipartum, and postpartum. She was a virgin before birth, during her birth, and after her birth. Quick question, you said Salome had witnessed the perpetual virginity of St. Mary? Yeah. What do you exactly mean by that? So, like, as a midwife would, for example, assist uh, uh, a woman giving birth. She, she is able to, to verify if she's still a virgin or she's not a virgin. She can see she helped her give birth. Make sense? Ask me <laughs> <laughs> So, what's special about her being ever virgin? So, there's a verse in Ezekiel, Ezekiel uh, 44, uh, chapter 44, verses 1 to 3, and it says, The Lord said to me, This gate shall be shut, it shall not be opened, and no man shall pass through it, because the Lord, the God of Israel, has entered by it. The fort shall be shut, it is for the prince, the prince himself shall sit in it. So this is um, a, a prophecy from the Old Testament that foretells that, the, uh, that St. Mary is not just a virgin, but after she gives birth to Christ, she will still remain a virgin because the door is shut, only Christ can come through and nobody. There are, of course, arguments against it from the uh, times of the early church. It started in the fourth century of uh, a guy named Helvetus. And basically, um, he had two concerns. One, he said in, in Matthew verse 125, when um, the, verse, the verse comes later, but basically, um, he says, how can... In the verse, it references Christ as the firstborn. So he says, if Christ is the firstborn, that should automatically mean that there are more sons, since they went out of their way to mention him being the firstborn. So if we see that in Exodus and Old Testament, he says, Consecrate to me all the firstborn, whatever opens the womb among the children of Israel, both of man and beast, it is mine. So this is the custom that St. Mary and Joseph followed when they took Christ to the temple. Uh, because he's consecrated to the temple of Jesus. So the fathers say every, every only child is a firstborn, but not every firstborn is an only child. So basically that means if you're an only child, you're still firstborn because you're the first to be born. But just because you're the first to be born doesn't mean you're the only child. But it can also, so it goes both ways. So the fathers say this is not an argument against him not being the only son because just because it says firstborn doesn't mean anything. The second point that uh, Helvetus makes, he, that's the same verse, uh, Matthew 1.25, when he says, she did not know, um, he did not know her, so she had brought forth her firstborn. This verse talks about 
St. Joseph, how he did not know St. Mary until uh, she had given birth to Christ. So he says that this verse surely means that after she had given birth to Christ, that St. Joseph and St. Mary had a just normal marriage, just like any other couple. But if you look at verses um, in the Old Testament, you'll see that this is a little bit different. Till in the Bible, or in the Gospels, or in the Old Testament was used, the word till or until, to mean eternally and not just until something happens. And you can see that in the upcoming verse. In Psalms 100 and then verse 1, it says, The Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand, till I make your enemies your footstool. Does this mean that after his enemies have become his footstool, he's not going to sit at his right hand anymore? It doesn't mean that. He's, that means it's forever. He sits at his right hand forever. In Genesis 8 7, that he sent out a raven which kept going to and, and from until the waters had dried up. We all know that in the story of Genesis in the ark, that the raven never came back. So here it says, until, so if, if, if until means up until a certain period, it would mean that the raven did come back after the waters had dried up, and that was not the case either. Michelle, the daughter of Saul, had no children till the day of her death in 2 Samuel. We all know that after she died, she did not give birth to no child. <laughs> so, and again, there's another verse in Matthew, I will be always given unto until the end of the age. So when the end of the age comes, is that doesn't mean that Christ is not going to us anymore? So the verse, the first verse that we, that we talked about, did not know her until she had brought forth the firstborn, which means he, did, he never got to know her like that, like a, a man would know anymore. Oh, well. yeah. I was just going to say, this is important because... Um, the influence of the evangelical church on the idea of the perpetual virginity of St. Mary. So the, 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 a lot of the churches of the West believe that St. Mary had many, uh, many children after Jesus, so that Jesus had brothers and sisters. So in our church, it's very foreign to us because we have this understanding. But to other churches, they're like, of course, yeah, Jesus had brothers and sisters. Right, exactly. So you, you'll see later on in the course of, of the talk that the way the Coptic church or the Orthodox Church um, in general, whether it's Oriental or Eastern, venerates St. Mary is different from the Catholics and different from the Protestants. And we'll, we'll go through a brief little touch on all this. So, just like Christ, Christ just mentioned, the brothers of the Lord. The term brothers of Christ is, is mentioned in these references um, in the Gospels. There's a, probably a 25, uh, I think a 25 or 30 page research paper um, that talks in details about the brothers of Christ. Uh, if you want access to it, you can talk to me after the talk, give you access to it. Um, so we're just going to briefly touch on this concept. We're not going to talk in detail about it because it's not the point of our talk. But uh, who are the brothers of Christ? Are they really sons of St. Mary or someone else? So at the cross, Christ said to St. Mary, woman, behold your son. And ever since uh, this issue came up in the, in the early church, St. John Chrysostom was the first to, to tackle it. And he said, if St. Mary had other sons besides Christ. Why would Christ tell her at the cross, woman, behold your son, son, behold your woman? Why did he give her to St. John to take care of? Why would what she could have been taken care of by any of her other sons, if she had other sons? So the term brother, brothers in the Bible is used to describe blood brothers. It's also used to describe common nationality when uh, it talks in chapter in John um, about how Christ, how the people of the same country said they did not believe um, and even it says, even his brothers did not believe in him about respect. His brothers meaning his fellow countrymen, everyone that, that lived in that same area. And also describes close relatives. Let's discuss brother from a different model, because this <laughs> is the first theory that we're going to talk about today. Um, it says that St. Joseph had sons from a previous marriage. And this is also, we come to find out about this from the same book, the Gospel of St. James. So, this is um, a lot of people do agree on this, but um, many Coptic scholars, including Pope Shunda, did not, it didn't make sense to me. And he said, this is probably not the, the most ideal theory to describe the brothers of Christ. Um, he said, basically, in the, in, the, in the narrative of the infancy of Christ, when, when he's giving birth, when Christ is, has been born, and when we go in the temple to consecrate him and everything, there is no mention at all of any other children of Joseph. If he had other children, we all know of the Holy Family composed of Joseph, Mary, and Christ, and Jesus. That's it. So had there been any sons to Joseph in the previous, previous marriage, it should have been mentioned in, in the story of the Nativity or in the early 
um, life of Christ, and that's not mentioned in the church. To Matthew in the Bible, uh, to, to try to describe how you know, it is actually a brothers of Christ from a different man to Joseph. So this is not a, a definitive answer. These are just different theories that describe who the brothers might have been. So some scholars, some church fathers agree that they, they are a previous sons of Joseph from a different marriage. Some say no, this is uh, his cousin, which we're going to talk about. Post relatives, and this is the most probable theory. In Genesis 11, uh, 31, it talks about Lot and Abraham as brothers. And we know that Lot was Abraham's nephew, he was not his brother. Also, in Ruth 1, 3, Boaz and Alimatic, they were relatives, and it talks about them as being brothers when they're not brothers. Um, St. Jerome agrees with this theory that Mary left upwards is the mother of Jesus, uh, which is St. Mary's sister. So James and Joseph are Christ's cousins from his mom's side. Anna, it says in the tradition that Anna, after she had given birth to St. Mary and given her up to the temple, consecrated, she gave birth to another uh, girl and also named her name. And that's later on came to be the wife of Christ and gave birth to James and Joseph. So this is the most probable theory of who the brothers of Christ are. Theotokos. It's a term that's been uh, thrown in the Coptic Church ever since the early days because a lot of heresies came up to, to try to, to defy that term. Theotokos means the bearer of God, the one who bore Christ in her womb. So Arianism, which is the heresy of Arius, was the reason why this term was used because we didn't want anyone to believe in what Arius had to say. And we're going to discuss that in a minute. The early her heresies in the church were before Arius, were the second century. It starts with the Gnostics, and they divided it into a Docetism, which was the first one. And basically what they says, what, what this uh, heresy said is that Christ is a phantom. He didn't really exist. He just appeared to have existed. And St. Mary was just a channel that he passed through to come bestow the knowledge that God has given to him on mankind. So St. Mary is just a channel, she has no value, and Christ is not really God, but he's just a phantom, an apparition. Um, uh, Manichaeism is sort of similar, it came out after, and, and just for the sake of time, not through, but it describes similarly the same event. Both of uh, these heresies were refuted by St. Anastasius and Pope Alexander. And St. Anastasius talks about an epistle to uh, Epictetus. Um, the seventh, the seventh epistle. So, if you want more references, we can go back to this. Arianism, a big, big, big stumbling block and a big, uh, big block and obstacle in the early church. He he drew a lot of Arius was a priest that drew a lot of attention because of this. Uh, his theory was that Christ is not divine. Christ is a being. He's lesser than God. He's not equal to God. Therefore, if St. Mary gave birth to Christ, she did not give birth to God, so he devalued Christ and ultimately devalued St. Mary. So St. Mary is not a Theotokos, and Christ is not divine. Christ is just a mortal being. St. Cyril was the one, um, he commented on, on this, and he said, after this we know of the resurrection of the dead, the first fruit of which was our Lord Jesus Christ, who is in everything, who is very deep, and not in appearance, really carried the body born of Mary, the mother of God the Creator. And the Sinestus also talked about it and said, Christ is born of the Father, who took his humanity from the unplowed earth, ever virgin, and Theotokos. Of course, Chris, uh, when we talk about the original sin, we mentioned um, Sinestus and the incarnation of Christ a lot. So this basically carried on. Sinestus was the one who took full pledge of uh, the Arian heresy and, and brought it down. Another heresy that came about a century later in the church, uh, around the year 428, was Nestorianism. And basically, his heresy, and I think we also mentioned this in the previous uh, talks briefly, was that St. Mary is not Theotokos, but she's Christos. She's not the mother of God, she's the mother of Christ. Because he also said that Christ is not God. Christ is just a man. Um, St. Cyril, Basically, the way they started is Nestorius was made a bishop of Constantinople, and one of his priests, his name was Anastasius, and one of the, Anastasius gave one time a lecture where he said, No one should ever call St. Mary Theotokos because she is nothing but a woman. She's not anything special, and Christ is nothing but a man. So, St. Cyril wrote multiple letters to 
um, the story is to tell him, like, check your board, talk to your priest. This is not the way things are. We don't, these are not our beliefs. That's not what we do. But the stories did support Anastasius and his doctrine, his beliefs, and did not uh, did not reverse his position. Part of this the Nestorianism of heresy is also that they didn't feel like uh, it was fit that the, that the shepherds would actually kneel uh, for Christ at the at the story of the Nativity because Christ is nothing but a man. He also believed in a term called Theophorum, that Christ was um, the, the God dwelt inside Christ, Christ was not God. So Christ was a body that God took to dwell inside, to live inside. Which, of course, we all know. In 431, at the Council of Ephesus, it was when they brought this issue to an end, they excommunicated the stories because he did not listen, did not take heed to all the letters that were sent to him to try to reverse his position. And he held up the term to your The Incarnation. Of course, very closely um, bound and related to St. Mary. If anyone does not accept Holy Mary as the book of St. Scala from the that St. Gregory uh, Indiana said that early in the church. Because back then the church was really adamant about fighting these heresies, so you can tell they were really like not joking about this issue. Moms, St. Cyril argued that moms, when they give birth to children, they don't really give them their personality. The mother has really nothing to do with the kid's personality. Yeah, of course she can raise them and do that, but the personality is something unique to the, to the child. But that does not take away anything from her being a mom. So the same thing is attributed to St. Mary. She gave birth to Christ. Of course she had nothing um, to do with him being God, but that doesn't mean that we don't regard her as the mother of God still. So we still think of her as the mother of God. She gave him the flesh that he used when he was incarnate. He needed the human body and he took that from St. Mary. So why did he take the flesh? Again, this for some reason. Colossians is how you say incarnation in Chinese, I'm not sure that's right. Colossian? Yeah, Colossian. Why did Christ take the flesh from St. Mary? The first reason is that to become a true descendant of Adam. Our blood runs our blood, our blood ran in the veins of Christ. He, he didn't just appear on earth with a, a human body. He took it from St. Mary. He took the fallen body and became an actual descendant of Adam. <coughs> God and man reconciled when God took the flesh. Man had fallen. God came, took that flesh. God reconciled man. And this is one of the reasons why we see the sacrifice, Christ being crucified on the cross, is because he was the priest and a sacrifice at the same time. He was God being lifted up, and he was a sacrifice being offered, being God and man at the same time. Also, St. Augustine says that through the new Eve, who St. Mary called her the new Eve, um, <laughs> women, the, the women, uh, womankind has been reconciled because back then there was a lot of heat on Eve because of what she did in giving Adam the apple and all that stuff. So all that was reconciled um, when St. Mary had given the flesh to and he referenced uh, 1 Timothy chapter 53 where it says, but women will be saved through childbirth. Mm -hmm. So is St. Mary sinful, just like all of us, or is she sinless? This is an idea that a lot of people struggle with, a lot of the fathers of the church debated on. And um, we're going to first talk about Immaculate Conception. The Catholic Church believes in something called the Immaculate Con Conception of St. Mary. That St. Mary was born without the original sin. We talked um, in the first talk about how we don't just believe in the concept that we carry the original sin itself, but we carry the consequence of it. But we also believe that St. Mary was not exempt from the consequence of, the, of original sin. Just like all of us, she, she was born with the same consequence, which was mortality, which is death. She was born just like the rest of us. Luke chapter 1 verse 47 says, My spirit has rejoiced in God my Savior. St. Mary profet, uh, proclaimed that she is in need of a Savior just like the rest of us. So how can she born, um, how, how can she be immaculate conceived if she is in need of a Savior just like all of us? This is crucial because in orthodoxy, this draws a, a line between who Christ is and who St. Mary is. We don't equate St. Mary with Christ. St. Mary is not worshipped. 
And we talked about that later. She is venerated. She's honored. But she's not worshipped because she's not like Christ. Christ is God. She cannot, only Christ is an act of Say, Ambrose says, when the Lord wanted to redeem the world, he began his work with man. That she, through whom salvation was prepared for all, should be the first to draw the fruit of salvation from the Son. St. John Chrysostom, Origen, and St. Marianos, um, they believe that St. Mary was, was sinful. She had sins just like everybody else. Most of, and um, Bruno Paul talked about this last week when we talked about Confessus Patrum, which basically means when we come to an, an issue in the church, we look back at what the fathers, the early fathers have said, and what the consensus is from most of the fathers, that's what the church believes in. And the consensus is that is that the church does not believe that St. Mary was sinful just like all of us. We, the church, Catholic Church, believes that St. Mary was unique in her, in her state. She was above, and she is above all angels. In holiness, um, we refer to her as the Ark of the Covenant. And as the Ark of the Covenant, and when the instructions were given to Moses to, uh, to put together the Ark of the Covenant, it had to be made of wood um, that would not decay. And it was lined with pure gold. So we believe that she um, is very unique in her state of existence, and she's not simple like the rest of us. Yet, that does not change her nature of humanity just like the rest of us. I did not, I did not find any church father who, who just came straight out and said, St. Mary has, has never seen sin, or has, but basically, we regard her higher than all the angels, higher than the rest of, him, in, uh, of mankind, because she's not like the rest. Some fathers reference to her as being uh, not defiled in the way of all uh, evil desires. And we see that now. So now he says, I did not propose one time was at a meet a churchman, a Bible study, and somebody, I guess, asked him a question. He said, that, I did not propose to have a single question raised on the subject of sin in regard to the Holy Virgin Mary out of respect for the Lord. So Jacob Pesuk says, How could I paint a picture of this marvelous, beautiful one? Ordinary fellows, too exalted and too glorious to exist in the view. She was wise and filled with love of God. She was never defiled by bad desires, had remained from childhood steadfastly just, and has always walked along the right way without fall or stumble. So this sums up what our church believes in when it comes to the simple nature of sin. Intercession, we're not going to talk much about it because we're going to, it, upcoming in the series, there's an uh, entire talk about intercession. But basically, the, the concept of intercession is that. All of us, as we draw closer to God, in the same fashion we draw closer to each other because we're all gravitating towards God. So as we draw nearer to God, we pray for one another because we care about one another. And in that same fashion, as St. Mary approaches God in her holiness and in her state, as she becomes closer to, as she became closer to God, she cares a lot about mankind in general because that's God's creation. So the character says, no man can obtain salvation outside of his relationship with others. And to separate veneration from worship, you have to know that worship is only given to Christ, the veneration and honor is given to the saints, in particular, St. Mary. The mere not worship. St. Uh, Epiphanius says that Mary be honored, but let the Lord be worshipped. So we do not worship St. Mary because a lot of the Protestant denominations accuse the Orthodoxy um, of worshiping St. Mary. And we uh, venerate her so much to the point of worship, and we don't do that. And we're going to discuss St. Mary and the rites in a little bit to see how we don't do that. Um, her intercession has limits, just like the saints. We, uh, in the story of the wedding at Cana of Galilee, she came to Christ and told him, there's no more wine. Of course, she knew that there was no more wine. But in turn, she turned to the, uh, to the men there, and she said, whatever he tells you, that go and do. So basically, her intercession is in a way that she draws our hearts closer to God to follow the commandment that God has given us. It's not for her to give commands. She didn't do that. She said, go and say and do what Christ, or what my son is going to tell you to do, and this is how you can get wine um, for the wedding. So in that same way, we have to understand that her, her, the limits of her intercession, she's not God. She's still, uh, she's still, she bears our nature. Her mother is not uh, just entitled, but a responsibility. And to this sin accept her and the sword will pierce your own soul too. She's not just the mother of God. She's become the mother for all of us. 
like the Blessed Mary, who was of such purity that she deserved to be the mother of God, you too can be a mother for the Lord. And St. Jerome says uh, this comment that he talks about how St. Mary is the church. How is St. Mary related to the rest of us now? St. Mary is our church. How do we see that? St. Ephraim the Seer says, Blessed are you, O church, for you of you, Isaiah, in his prophetic song, the joy says, Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, the hidden mystery of the church. Of course, he relates the prophecy of Isaiah uh, that we talked about earlier on, that the virgin shall conceive, talking about St. Mary, to the actual church, that the church will conceive and bear forth a son. Who's the son? It's the incarnate word of God dwelling in all of our hearts. So St. Mary is not the only one that bore Christ, but she was, she was the one who born him physically so that we can all uh, bear him inside of us, bear the word of God in our heart. She is, of course, a mother to us all. It's not just, she's not just venerated in songs, but she's a true mother. Like, we all love to her, we all praise her, because we have that bond that we're all connected to our nature through Christ. She bore, she bore Christ, and in turn, we took on Christ. St. Mary is very similar to the church. St. Mary is a mother to Christ, in the same fashion that the church is a mother to us all. St. Mary is also a virgin. Before and after, we talked about that extensively. The church is also a virgin. The church is a virgin in its undefiled faith, in its purity. We kept the faith ever right since the beginning. St. Mary was conceived by the Holy Spirit. So was the church when, at the Feast of Pentecost, when the Holy Spirit came down and uh, dwelt on the apostles. And St. Mary was obviously, she gave birth to the Logos through his humanity. She gave birth to the Word of God through humanity. And in the same way, the church is the mother or she, the church gives birth to its members through baptism. So whenever we think of St. Mary, we think of the church. And this is related, we're going to see this is important because later on when we praise St. Mary so much, we're not just praising her for her person, we're actually praising the entire church that accepted Christ. So, this takes, on to the, uh, this takes us to the next point, which is St. Mary in the Coptic Church rights. In how do we pray St. Mary and how do we venerate St. Mary in the Coptic Church? St. Mary takes more of a doxological focus in the hymns rather than a theological focus. What, what does that really mean? It means that the theology of St. Mary takes uh, place the most in the hymns of the church. We see that the hymnology of the Coptic Church is full of references, of references excuse me, to St. Mary. Um, and what we believe about St. Mary and her nature. When you walk into a traditional Catholic church, you first go through um, basically the entire church and you will come to a big icon stasis. And after you cross the icon stasis, you cross into the altar. And the altar is where the mystery of incarnation takes place, where the mystery of communion takes place. In a similar fashion, if you guys do attend this Beha on Saturday evening, this is where a lot of references to St. Mary are being made. But the Tisbah usually starts with four hosts in the beginning, and then it moves on to the commemoration of the saints, and then something called the Sali and the Tukhayi. The first part of Tisbah, which is the four hosts, resembles the outside part of the church. How we come all the way from the beginning, from how we were lost, how we were defiled, and coming to reconcile with God and receive the new nature through communion. We arrive at the Alkalistas, which bears all the saints, at the same point that in the Tisbaha, we are at the commemoration of the saints. And once we cross the commemoration, once we cross the icon of Tassis, we talk about incarnation, we talk about God, we talk about communion. And in the same way in Tisbaha, we start talking about the sign of Theotokeya. Theotokeya describes, basically, the term Theotokeya means hymns for St. Mary, or hymns of St. Mary. And what's special is that there's so many references to the Incarnation. Again, why is that important? Because in this Beha on Saturday evening, we're all preparing to take communion right the next day. Everyone is concerned about this mystery of Incarnation, this mystery of communion. That is why there's so many references to the Incarnation. So why do we talk about her so much on Saturday evening and during liturgy at church, on Sundays or during the day? It's because we're so concerned, consumed by the idea of communion that we're about to take, the reconciliation that is symbolized in all these different symbols of St. Mary. So it's not just that we forget about Christ and we try to just venerate St. Mary and talk about her so much. When we talk about St. Mary, 
We are talking about the incarnation. We're talking about Christ. This is part of the, the subject of the faith. It says, God, the Word, became man without separation. He is one of the two. The Holy and the Holy the Divinity is one of the Father and so on and so forth. If we take the Theotokayas and, and put them just in a book, like of the days and Sundays, we will be able to describe, um, I'm not sure if it's all, or most of the, the dogma and the theology of the Orthodox Church. Because we use it to defend. This is how we proclaim and profess our, our faith. All of our faith, all of what the church believes in, is actually in all these theotokayas, just like this is an example of it. During liturgy, the next morning, when we go, we start with a hymn called Cher Mare, or Hail to Mare. Uh, while it's right before we, we sing Kyrie Eleison, Kyrie Eleison, with the symbols and the priest is standing in front of the altar, and he's picking and he's choosing which one is going to be the lamb. And we sing this hymn right before this happened for obvious reasons. Christ, who is the Lamb of God, who came and was incarnate, so we, we hail Mary, we exalt St. Mary, who gave birth to Christ, that the priest is about to choose. Later on, we talk about the, the hymn Taishori and the censor. This is purely on the incarnation, how the call is about Christ's divinity and humanity are united in one uh, without actually the divinity or the five virgin call. And obviously this gives tribute to St. Mary who bore Christ in her womb, who bore God in her womb, and God did not hurt her in any way. Then we move on to the, through the intercessions of the Hittimis, or the Hittimis, and we talk a lot about St. Mary's because that's when we come under the same. Right before the Acts, we sing another hymn that says, Help to you, the beautiful dove. And again, because St. Mary resembles the, st uh, the stainless church, the act that she bore Christ in her womb, just like we're about to see God the Word through the, the readings. All of these readings and all the hymns that revolve around the readings talk about the Incarnation. In one way or another, reflect on the Incarnation of Christ. Later on, after the prayer of reconciliation, we find a different hymn and we say rejoice on it. And we don't say it often, but it's in the lights of the church. And we say it most of the time during the Feast of Saint Mary, uh, the Fast of Saint Mary. But this time we're not focused on the incarnation as much. We're focused, we're saying rejoice, Mary, because we've, we've been just reconciled. The person, Christ, the God that you just gave birth to, has reconciled God and man, and we're happy to receive our salvation. So let's rejoice, and Mary rejoice because you've done all this for, for the rest of us. There's an entire Coptic month that's devoted for St. Mary. It's called the month of Kiat. If you're able to tune out all the hymns that were added on to the church, um, during the centuries, there's a lot of it that don't have any theology, and a lot of it has actually like wrong teachings of the church that were added by just laymen. Um, I don't know if you guys have ever heard like Ahmad Yabala Hasar. All this stuff was really added on to the church later on. It was not part of the original Coptic Christ. Um, the, the 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 hymnology, the the music, and the actual text in the, in, in, the, in these hymns is beautiful. It, it commemorates because obviously. Kiat comes right before um, the Feast of the Nativity, so we're prepared for an entire month to receive God the Incarnate. And obviously, there's no way to more, there's no better way to commemorate that than to praise Saint Mary who gave birth to Christ. During Holy Week, during Pascha, there is no mention of any saints at all, except for uh, the parts right before the explanation where the priest uh, uh, sings. sings uh, this is the only reference of any um, for any saints during Pascha week. So Saint Mary is the only one that we mention before the explanations because again she gave birth to Christ the incarnate who was about to be crucified. So it's not just about Saint Mary, it's about who Saint Mary is, who the church is. She's also mentioned in the Agbeya, in the, in the canonical hours, and every hour there's a paragraph attributed to St. Mary. And also before the Creed, also the ultimate exalted mother of the Trial of the Old Christ and the Book. St. Mary has a lot of symbols in the Old Testament, and these symbols are mentioned all throughout this Bah and um, the Midnight Priest. She is symbolized to Noah's Ark. Noah resembles or symbolizes Christ because he gave salvation. Uh, to eight people on the earth, basically, who are saved. 
So the body that embodied Noah and everyone that was saved symbolizes Saint Mary because she saved Noah or she saved mankind. She's also referred to as Jacob's ladder in his dream because Christ descended upon the ladder to become incarnate and give us salvation. She's the burning bush because when Christ dwelt in her, the burning bush never uh, was never consumed by the fire, just like Saint Mary was never consumed by the divinity of God. She was a rational mountain that God came down upon, descended upon to give Moses his commandments, the word of God. Just like in the same way God descended upon St. Mary to dwell in her, the locust, the word of God dwelt in her. She's also the tabernacle of the meeting in the Old Testament. Uh, in the verse where we say the power of the highest will overshadow you, the angel says, so the same way. The same verb, uh, the Greek verb, which is, which is used in this, in this verse, is also used to refer to the, to, to the tabernacle as a dwelling place of God. And it's also the same verse that's used in the Transfiguration to talk about the cloud that dwelt among uh, the saints. So this reference to St. Mary to be the tabernacle that embodied the Ark of the Covenant, or the, the sorry, embodied Christ in the Ark of the Covenant. The Ark of the Covenant is also another symbol of St. Mary. It was kept for three months at the house of uh, Obed Edom before David, King David, would actually be able to, to retrieve it. Just like St. Mary spent three months uh, with Elizabeth before she gave birth to Christ. Also, it says that when King David received uh, the Ark of the Covenant from the house, he leaped of joy. And the same Hebrew verse of leap that was used then was used uh, to describe how John in the, in, inside Elizabeth leaped uh, in front of Christ. So, St. Mary is the Ark of the Covenant. She's also the cover of the Ark of the Covenant because Christ came down. Um, at the, um, Christ came down before the two cherubs on the cover to talk to Moses. Obviously, there's so many symbols, and I'm going to skip all these symbols, but all these are just symbols of St. Mary in the Old Testament. And I <laughs> so, if you need more information about this, we can we're going to post the PowerPoint yeah, too. So. St. <laughs> Mary is referred to um, as the model of virgins. So, St. Anastasius wrote an uh, excerpt and he called it a letter to virgins. And this is basically, I skipped around and just highlighted three important things. He said, ask God to examine. She did not ask men to examine her, she asked God to examine her. She generously distributed to the poor what was left out of the works of her hand. She prayed so I to God. Um, she did not let that thought stay good in her heart. This is a prayer that St. Athanasius wrote so that she can be a model for the entire church. That we should learn from how she lived her life and do the same things that she did. We should all be so generous to the poor. We should all pray to God in, sol in solitary and have that bond between us and between Christ. So Andrew says, have done before your eyes as an image the virgin life of Mary, from whom as from the mirror shines forth the brightness and chastity and the form of virtue. The feast of St. Mary in the Catholic Church. The Annunciation to her parents. When the angel came, also in the book of John of James, it says that the angel came to announce the birth of Mary to her parents. And this is we celebrate that on the seventh of the Her nativity, which is not um, common to celebrate the nativity of the saints. We usually commemorate the martyrs on the day when they were martyred. But for St. Mary, we commemorate her birth. Obviously significant. Um, her presentation to the temple, when she was consecrated at three years old. And that's the third of yeah. Her falling asleep, we call it the Dormition of Mary, and that's at the 21st of Tuba. And her Assumption, which is the, the, the biggest feast that we celebrate for her, two weeks after, um, two weeks after we, we fast. We fast for two weeks and we celebrate the Assumption. Her falling asleep, there are two accounts. There's one account, basically, for the falling asleep and the Assumption. There are two accounts. There's one account in the Synexarium, and there's one account in a book called The Discourse of Pope Theodosius. He basically wrote uh, an account, but they're a little bit different. Basically, it says that before St. Mary passed, Christ came and he dwelt with the uh, apostles and he was talking to them and he was talking to St. Mary and how he was like talking to St. Mary and saying, I wish I could just like take you up to heaven with me without you dying. But I'm afraid that when the day comes, we have to go down to die just like Elijah, um, and you not just in the same fashion. People will, will, will consider you a god or a goddess. 
So I'm not going to do that. I will let you just fall asleep here, and then I will assume you body. And all the saints and apostles were obviously mourning inside because St. Peter was going to leave them the next day. And Christ said to St. Peter, I'm going to leave some garments on the altar. You should put St. Mary in these garments so that when she passes away, she can be, uh, she can be, that, that can be her coffin. Then, when the next day came when St. Mary actually passed away, they took her body and they were walking to a, a field called the Field of Jessica, where they buried her body. And the uh, tradition says that while they were walking to, to bury her, uh, a, lot of the, a lot of the Jews saw that they were walking St. Mary inside to the, to the tomb and they were like, if they actually, if the, if the Christians get there and embrace it, maybe this, this is going to become like a holy site and people are going to come and worship her and people are going to love her. So let's just burn the body. So they ran after uh, the saints to burn the body of St. Mary. And it says that in the tradition that they all became blind. Later on they, uh, they prayed and they, they repented and God was doing this side. The story of Assumption says that St. Thomas, one time when he was returning from India from one of the mission trips, saw the, the body of St. Mary being sewn to heaven and she gave him um, a piece of her garment to hold on to. So when he arrived to the saints and asked them about St. Mary, they said, oh, she had, she's already departed. And he says, where? Come and show me. Um, he obviously knew that her body wasn't there because he had just seen her body soon. So he went to the tomb and he opened it and she wasn't there. So the tradition says that they went back and seven months later, 206 days exactly, they met uh, in the house they prayed all night a vigil prayer um, so that Christ can show them what happened to the body and then Christ showed them a vision of what the assumption looked like. A lot of stories conflict on this one. They say the actual assumption happened then. A lot of stories say that um, St. Mary died first and then seven months later her body, or 26 days her body was assumed. So I heard uh, St. Thomas said, unless you show me her body, I will, know my, I, I will by no means believe, just like he did with Christ. Right. Um, and I, and I wanted to know if that was an actual... Yeah, so basically, in, in this story, it's made... A lot of people quickly jump to the conclusion that saying Thomas is a doubter just because he doubted Christ before. But in this particular instance, he's forgiven. He's not really doubting because he has, he'd already seen it. Right. He knew that if he... Like, they wouldn't believe him. So they wanted, he wanted to take them back to the tomb, open it, and prove that the body is not actually there. Um, one of the feasts, also the dedication of the churches in her name at the Bones and the Tree, two places in, in Egypt. The apparition in Zaytun um, was written extensively on. We have documentation and pictures when she appeared multiple times in Zaytun. There was a report by the Pope and there was a report by the actual uh, government, the Egyptian government, that, that authenticates the apparition of St. Mary at Zaytun. This is the uh, uh, St. John of the Denison says about St. Mary's body. He said, it is necessary that the body of the one who preserved her virginity intact and giving birth should also be kept in corrupt after that. It was necessary that she, the care of the creator of the womb, when she was a baby, when he was a baby, she dwelt in one tavern after of heaven. From her, we have hardness of the gift of life, and her we have cultivated the sin of immortality. For our sake, she became the mediatrix of all blessings, and her God became man, and man became God. And again, the same, the last verse that was in the beginning of the prayer of St. Paul. I wake all my heart from the chords and praise of the Virgin Mary. Lift up your voice and sing the wonderful history of the Virgin and God of David, who gave birth to the right of the world. Any questions? This is not a proper bibliography, but if you need any more sources or references, we can talk about the departments. About the perpetual virginity, I heard a story in the Arnold's, again, it's another tradition, that um, St. Simeon the Elder uh, was one of the writers of the Septuagint, and that he, I guess, I can't remember exactly which verse, he was trying to write the word um, a lady, but kept changing right. it to virgin. We talked about that name before you Okay. Come. Yeah, so basically, that is, that is true. In Isaiah chapter 7, um, where the verse says, and the virgin shall conceive and give birth, um, he was confused about that. He was like, that can be right, must be a lady or a woman. And the angel came to him and said, we should be not going to die until the actual day comes and you see the prophecy from him. Um, if Virgin Mary had a sister, when she was 12, why should 
So the tradition says that Anna and Joachim didn't have babies for a long time. They couldn't have kids. So when, when God, when the angel announced to her that she's going to have a baby, she vowed that she's going to consecrate the baby that she's going to give birth to to God. It should belong to God. She's not, it's not going to be her own child. So she had vowed and consecrated St. Mary before she was even born. So when she had given birth to St. Mary, she automatically gave St. Mary up to the temple to serve, to serve God. So she was consecrated like... Like a monk would be consecrated, for example, in the same fashion. For St. Joseph's two sons that you were talking about, right. couldn't Mary be referred to as the stepmother at that time? Why did it have to be his ex-wife or whoever it was happened to also be named Mary? Couldn't Mary be just the stepmother that was there for them? Right, so if, if the theory of of the two kids, or, or the, the, because there's actually more names mentioned in other uh, chapters. If that theory were to hold up, I, I, yeah, I guess because there's the St. Joseph's kids from the previous marriage. But that theory is again debatable. The fathers of the church lean more towards the theory of cousins rather than the sons of, of Joseph. Any guys who coming?